welcome friends to the bandara of great master azur maharaj baba sawan singh tomorrow 2nd of april day after tomorrow the 2nd of april will be the official day when we celebrate this bandara every year bandara means bandar celebration of bandar bandar is abundance we celebrate the abundance of grace that comes on this particular day of course grace flows all the time grace of a perfect living master is like a rain shower when raining hard lot of water is coming down we can all fill our cups if we like only the cup has to be kept with this open up the cup is down it does not get filled up no matter how much it rains in this case when we talk of grace grace is accepted by that part of our consciousness we call our attention if our attention is towards our true self and true master within the cup gets filled up with the grace if our attention is upside down which means it's all outside nothing going inside no matter how much it rains how much grace comes it does not get filled up if our attention is divided partly inside and partly outside you can imagine a cup left sideways is raining few drops may get in but not too much is the same thing grace is coming all the time but sometimes the shower is heavier than other days in normal rain and the extra shower second of april has been observed by me personally to be a day for extra shower and that is why i think it's a great opportunity for us to have our cups all put up up in straight to get filled up with the grace that will flow on the 2nd of april on the 2nd of april 1948 my master whose picture you see here great master hazur maharaj baba sawan singh he left his body in other words he died are we celebrating the death of a person It's not normal to celebrate the death of a person. We normally condole and we mourn. How are we celebrating something's death? Somebody's dead. The reason is that when we find who he is, who a perfect living master is, it's a very big discovery. It is totally surprising that a human being with an ordinary human body, living an ordinary human life. can be something so different in a, in his relationship with his disciples we think the disciple master relationship is one of a physical master teaching his disciples how to meditate that is not even 0.01% of the relationship of a master and disciple the real re relationship is so much deeper it is not even in the radiant form of a master which means that our own astral form which existed before we were born and will exist after we die so was the master existing in his astral form before he was born and will still exist after he dies and we have a relationship with that form also but that's not all we go deeper the causal form of our own self in this physical body which is being used by us to think our causal form is our mind and the mind is being used by us to think this thinking part of us has a life of millions of years the same mind continues in so many forms of astral forms we get and maybe hundreds or thousands of physical forms we get during one life of one mind 
and the relationship of a master with a disciple is even beyond that mind. Beyond the mind is our life force, which makes us alive, which makes our mind alive, which makes our astral self or our sense perceptions alive, which makes our physical body alive, which makes the whole world alive. That is our soul. A perfect living master's relationship with us is with the soul. His soul with our soul, both are immortal, but never born, will never die. So that is why we think it's simply a relationship with a physical person who has come here and one day he will die, master is gone. That is not true at all. When do we really find that the physical death of a master is a cause for celebration, which we are doing now. We discover if we have done little homework during the time when the master is alive and been able to go just one simple step within ourselves in the area of imagination, in the area of sense perceptions, in the area of perceiving, if we can go just one step and perceive the face of our master inside and are able to talk to that form inside, we discover on the day of the master's physical death, he is more alive than ever before. And that's the reason why I celebrate. It's not that the master died. For his disciples, he became more alive on the 2nd of April, 1948. And this is not from any book I'm reading. I'm telling you from my experience. And that is why I have great, great joy in celebrating this day in which I found that instead of having to travel to the Dera by train, by tongas, horse carts, and on foot to see the master, after that day I could see the master everywhere, anytime. It's a very big difference. That is why we call it the day of abundance, the day of Pandara. And this is what we are celebrating to understand what a perfect living master really is. Looks like an ordinary human being. Acts like an ordinary human being. Lives like an ordinary human being. Is born like an ordinary human being. Dies like an ordinary human being. Falls sick like an ordinary human being. Goes to doctors like ordinary human being. Great master died of prostate cancer. Most, most people have that. Many people in India, many people have. Even in this country, many people have. He went through the normal process. He got treated by doctors. And I watched him very closely because I was practicing homeopathic practice. And, and along with another famous homeopath, Dr. Pierre Schmidt, we were both treating. Great master. And when he died, he needed no treatment. He was very healthy. When he was sick, when he was in the body, he was sick. So we do not understand what a master is. A master is like any one of us. No difference in the body. No difference in the karma. No difference in the destiny. Exactly like us. The only difference is that he is aware of not only this physical world, he is aware of his inner self that can see another world, the astral world. He is aware of the higher world where everything is being created, the causal plane. He is aware of the soul. And if he is a perfect living master, not merely a living master, he is also aware of the unity of one source of consciousness from where all of us have come. That awareness of a perfect living master is not something he has learned. It's not something that he had an experience once and he has come to tell us now, I had a great experience. When I was meditating, I had a great experience and I'm going to tell you about it. That's not a perfect living master. A perfect living master has this awareness of all levels of creation and the level of the creative power, the one single creative power at all times, even in the physical body. Even when he talks to us, he is aware of all these 
levels of awareness, levels of consciousness simultaneously. We can also get that. If, we, if his body is like ours, if his mind is like ours, if our soul is like ours, we all have the capability of getting the same thing. He is not unique that way. In terms of potential, of getting to the highest levels of awareness, we all have the same potential, exactly the same that a perfect living master has. We are all in a way perfect living masters in the making. And we can all make use of the time we have in physical bodies here to move toward that end. It is strange that this possibility of going to the highest levels of awareness and highest level of the creative power should exist only in human beings. There are so many forms of life all around us. There are plants, there are weeds in the sea, they're all living entities. They all have souls. The same soul we have. They don't have an inferior soul or a different type of soul. Soul is life. Soul is whatever can put life into something is soul. Soul is the same for all. All life forms have the same soul. And look at the vast possibility of forms of life. In some of the Indian scriptures, they have listed 8.4 million forms of life that exist in this universe that we know of. This current universe that we can examine around us has 8.4 million forms of life. In each one of them, the same soul, same kind of soul comes, not different soul. More than half the number is in the plant kingdom, according to that list. Then comes very small amoebas, insects, and then it moves on to rodents and birds, mammals, ultimately human being, and then goes on to angels. And souls working as gods, goddesses, those we worship as God, also a soul. They are going right to the top, all souls. Some very enlightened souls living for millions of years in the causal plane, some living thousands of years in astral bodies in that, in that world, not in physical world, all have the same soul. And yet out of this 8.4 million forms of life, only one form of life so uniquely placed is a human form of life. What is so unique about this human form is it should be chosen to be the only form in which we have the potential to be the same like a perfect living master. The unique feature is this is the only form in which we are totally ignorant of the future and have a great sense of free will. We all have free will. At least that's the experience. People are questioning, is it real or not real? Somebody came to me, I'm trying to find out is free will real or not real? I said, there you have got free will. You're trying to find out. Obviously, you're trying to find out if you have free will or no free will. You're using free will to find that out. There is no way we can... Stop exercising free will. Free will is we do not know what will happen tomorrow, what will happen day after, what will happen next minute. For some time it, accidents happen with no knowledge at all. Since we have no knowledge, we think we have to decide what we can do in the next few minutes, in the next few days, in the next few years in our life. This unique experience in the mind of a human being, to exercise free will. Real or not is a separate question, and I'll deal with it. But the experience of free will is real. 
We all have it. We can't deny it. We can't even escape it. So that is why this unique feature of free will makes us feel we decide what we like to have. Therefore, we can search for anything we want. We can seek what we want. And that is a great thing. We have in our physical bodies a mind that searches. And we have a soul in our bodies that seeks. There is a difference between search and seeking. Search is a mental activity. Seeking is a spiritual activity. Search into, into an area is where what we are searching for is in front of us. We are looking for something external to ourselves. If we want to search something internal, it's still a mental search with something that we place in front of our mind, inside or outside. Seeking is something that we cannot define. We know we are seeking something, we are not sure what it is. And when that happens, when we are seeking something and not sure what it is, is something we are seeking. And it's so deep in us. It's not thoughts. Thoughts are searching something outside. Seeking is something else. Seeking is telling us, this is not our place. Search is saying, this is the place to search. There's a difference in the two. Seeking is by the soul of its true self and searches for something created by consciousness outside, outside of itself. That is why this unique ability to search and seek is coming only because we have the experience of free will. If you look at all the species of life forms, no other species is doing this. They are all living instinctively pre-programmed destinies. They are pre-programmed to do remarkable things. The other day, somebody sent me a video of a Japanese fish that works on the sand at the bottom of the sea and just with its fins makes patterns and makes absolutely beautiful, ge geometrically correct round patterns and, and, men, and what they call different kind of patterns, flowers, things, so perfect. We see it from the top and we are surprised and that fish cannot see it, what is making, but makes perfection. We have such a simple insect like a honeybee. The honeybee is making hive. The hives are just holes in which they can place honey and eggs and so on. Each one is octagonal, eight sides. And each one of the sides of the octagonal is equal up to the fourth decimal point of a centimeter. This exact measurement a honeybee is making with no measuring tools, with no power to observe from outside, which we can observe. How is it doing it? Not only honeybees, every living form is working instinctively according to a pre-programmed destiny and is carrying out that function automatically. We are too. Most of the time, we are also predestined to be born where we are born, die where we die, have accidents where we have accidents, meet people where we have to meet accidentally. They are all predestined. We don't decide. We don't use free will for that. It's only a few gaps in our life in which we use free will and make decisions when choices open up. If no choice opens up, we just go with the flow. If a choice opens up, this or that, here or there, now or then, this side or that side, east or west, then you have to decide. That's where free will comes in. The experience of free will is unique. What about angels, gods? What about people, souls living in higher levels of consciousness? Why don't they have free will? Well, because they know the future. And they know that even what they thought was free will was pre-programmed. We can also find out that what we think is our decision making, free will, is also pre-programmed. But just because we don't know how it has worked out and we think the brain, by thinking of choices to make, 
by deciding what to decide, what to take, where to go, by taking the decisions, it is acting afresh. If you could find out your destiny, you'll find all the decisions and the way the mind will think to make those decisions all predetermined. It's only in the physical plane that we are bereft of that knowledge of how the programming is done, what the program is, we have no knowledge. Therefore, although the brain and the mind are totally pre-programmed to think in a certain way, to decide things in a certain way, therefore, we really have no free will. It's an experience of free will for lack of knowledge of the future. But so what a gift it is. Supposing we did not have this ignorance, which I'm, I'm glad to say this ignorance is bliss. In this case, it's really a bliss. Because if we knew the future and we knew there's no way to decide anything except what is the future, that's the only way the mind will think to decide. And that's how it is deciding even now. We'll be automatons drifting away in life with no seeking. Imagine the gift that has been given to us of having an experience. By cutting off knowledge, experience of seeking. What happens? We search all our life and spend our life searching outside. We even search for things which we think are spiritual. We search for God. We search for our true self. We search for the soul. And we search by reading books. We go to libraries. We go to meetings. We even go to bandaras. <laughs> we go everywhere outside. And none of this gives us any information at all. They only confuse us more. Why should they confuse? If you're searching for something, why should confusion come? The confusion comes because the laws of this universe in which we are operating as physical beings are very different from the laws of other levels of awareness. We are searching for something of other levels of awareness trying to apply the laws of this universe. They don't work. Therefore, we find inconsistencies. We find inconsistencies. We read a book by a perfect living master saying, you have to meditate very hard. Go at your third eye center. Pull all your attention there. Work for hours for that. And then you will find out who you are. You are not the body. You are something else. We turn some pages, same book says, your meditation will do nothing. It's all grace of the master. Which one is correct? In this physical world, there's contradiction. Obvious contradiction. One is saying meditation is good. The other says meditation is no use. Which one is correct? Mind gets confused. Both are correct. At another level. Not at this physical level. At another level, you will find it's grace that makes you do meditation. It's grace that makes you feel, I have to meditate hard. It's a grace flowing in a different way. And later on, meditation is not necessary. Grace flows through love of a master. Completely normal. I'm even explaining it in physical terms. That there is no real inconsistency. But there's so many other inconsistencies that come up in our search. But no inconsistency in our seeking. We seek the real thing. We want to see our real home, our real place, where we belong, where have we come from, who are we, what is our self. That's what we seek. We seek our own self. That's a very important thing. We seek our own self because we have a feeling, inwardly, spiritual feeling, inside. There is something hidden inside us which will open up all the gates of information and gates of awareness. This feeling is what leads to the seeking of something inside. We know it's not to be found outside. And masters have come and said over and over again, the truth is inside. Kingdom of God is inside. The reality is inside. Everything you see outside is inside. They make these statements. 
and they make no sense to us. We go to a dentist and he puts some needle. You know, everything is out here. The pain makes everything real here. It's amazing how pain works to make reality out here. And we go, Shakespeare said, there never yet was philosopher who could bear the dental pain, something like that. Which means that even the greatest philosophers talking of this unreality illusion give them a little pain. I remember my own little, little fun story. Not very funny at that time. <laughs> there was a man who came to the Dera of Great Master. Great Master had given his very beautiful discourse and he pretended that he was as high as Great Master and sat on a platform outside telling people, I have just gone to Parabrahm and I have gone to Satchkhand and I visit these places every day. I said, the man who talks so much about this has no knowledge at all. Masters don't say that at all. This man, I think he doesn't know that uh, these people are all being fooled by him. I was very young, this small, maybe 10 or 11. As it happened, I had a safety pin attached to my handkerchief. I don't know what I kept it for, but I had a safety pin for use sometimes if my clothes get torn or something, I can put it on. I took out the safety pin, opened it up. When he was talking of high regions, I just poked it his back. <laughs> and I ran. He got so angry, mad, he got up and ran after me. And all I remember shouting back at him was, where are the five boys? Now this reference to five boys is, they say that if you really have gone above the mind, these five verses, including anger, go away. So they are sometimes referred to in the Indian scriptures like five boys leaving you. So I referred to that and I said, look at your anger. You're making so many claims here. If you really had that experience, no provocation would have made you angry. So that is why a little safety pin can test the awareness of a person. I discovered that a little pain and you find the reality of this universe and the reality of the man. So that is why our whole life is based upon experiences here. And when the seeking comes from within, that's a different experience. The seeking is, who am I? Am I really this body? It couldn't be. I believe we can hear some inner sound. That's not inner. I didn't do anything. <laughs> All right, I'm telling you about the seeking that's unique to human being. And the seeking is the secret. People want to ask me, give us one simple secret to find our true home, to find our true self. I said, one word, seek. Seek, seek you will find. Period. Just seek. What do you seek? Seek yourself. Can you imagine all these levels of awareness I talk about? All the higher experiences I talk about are all contained in ourself. Nothing is outside. Everything is contained in our own self. If you can seek yourself, you get all the answers to all your questions. You will find everything you ever want to find if you seek nothing but yourself. The self is the secret and the self is to be sought. If you can seek yourself, what will you find? You will find the self operating in a physical body is obviously working in the body, not outside. In the body, if the self were consciousness, life, 
it is all over the body. Is it operating from any particular point in the body? Is there any point in this whole human body which is alive and kicking? Can you locate a point from where you can say that your life is working out throughout the body? All medical people know it's in the brain. When the brain dies, you die. And before that, everything else can die. You're still alive. Supposing we are not a medical person, but we just want to examine yourself. Close your eyes and say, if I am using a body, I am not the body, but I am using the body, where could I possibly be? Am I in my hands? Am I in my feet? Am I in my legs? Am I in my heart? Am I in my torso? Where am I thinking? This? Where am I asking this question from? All comes down to one clear answer. It's all somewhere in the head. Nowhere else. Examine further. Where is my self if it is not the body? Where am I operating from, thinking from, questioning from, seeking from? Exactly within the head. Is it from my ears? Is it from the right side, left side, top side, bottom? Answer comes, no, it's somewhere in the center. It just takes a few minutes to examine this. If it's in the center, where exactly? in the center. Can I just, by contemplation, by trying to recall where I think from, where I work from as a living entity inside the body, working this body from, you can, after some time, find out it's exactly in the center, behind the eyes, between the eyes, behind the eyes, somewhere in the center. Very, very accurate. Geometrically, I could describe it. If you take these eyes and draw straight lines into your head, behind the eyes, straight lines, then draw a line between your ears, which are a little set back. Draw a line between your ears and two lines straight behind the eyes. These two lines will cross that line, create a little bench. Behind the eyes, you are sitting right on that bench in the middle. Very accurate. If you want to go by medical terminology, the point I've just described happened to be called the pituitary body, the pineal gland, just above the medulla oblongata. It's exactly in the center, the most protected point in the body with a skull, gray matter, is the most protected and a lot of things to hold it, not get broken or disturbed. The most well-protected portion of the human body is containing the seat from where we are conscious in the wakeful state. Now this we can examine because we are sitting awake. Can we examine when we are sleeping? No. We are not even aware of the body. Is it still there when we are sleeping? Or does it move? Is this position actually tied out to the physical organ? I hear people writing books. If the pineal gland is holding consciousness all the time, not true at all. It's holding attention very strongly, very localized when we are awake, not when we are in any other state of being. When we go to sleep, the same location which we know from our own contemplation lies behind the eyes at the pineal gland shifts downwards. If we can test it out, I tell people to test out when you are going to sleep, when you are half asleep, try to touch your eyes. Now I can say I am behind the eyes because I can close my eyes and touch my eyes. Yeah, I know where they are. Okay. Half asleep, try to touch your eyes, you touch your nose and think you are touching your eyes. How can that be? When you are little half asleep, just about to sleep, you are still conscious of your body. Just try to touch your eyes and you touch below the eyes. Because that notional point which in wakeful state 
you know behind the eyes is shifting. Actually, there are certain yogic exercises by which you can retain awareness of the body. And as you go to sleep, you can see it descending, descending. And when you have dreams, what you think are your eyes are in the throat. If in a dream you could be aware, I want to touch my eyes. Suppose you program a person and he's sleeping. Touch your eyes. He will touch his throat and think he's touching his eyes. If he reacts to the same action, in dream he'll touch his eyes. In the body he'll touch his throat. In very deep meditation or in deep sleep, it can even go down. Yogic practices have often led to movement of this notional point of consciousness all over right to the six centers of energy below. And sometimes they practice. I have done that practice for some years in order to see if the concentration of our attention at the energy centers can open up an awareness of who I am. It did not give me any information about the self. It gave me information about the energy I contain. It gave me different experiences at every different center, but no knowledge of who is having the experience. Who is the one, the self, who is having this experience? Who is getting it? So the question, have I found myself, was never answered by putting all my attention on the six centers of energy. Till I realize centers of energy are not centers of awareness at all. They are merely centers of energy to regulate our experience in the physical world. They regulate all our experiences here, all our energy here, all energetic experiences. And the highest center out of the six centers is the center in the eyes. This ref reference is sometimes made to these centers of energy as petals of a lotus. That we start from wakeful state to perform a yogic exercise of the six chakras, six energy centers. These two petal lotus, we straight away go down as if there is an elevator at the back of the body in the spine. We are still experimenting in the body, but not in the head, below the body. And we go down, start from the sixth center, four petal lotus, six petal lotus, the lotuses. And as you see the different forms of the organ inside, they correspond to the lotus and the ultimately 16 petal lotus with dreams can take, and then ultimately two petal lotus back to the eyes. The two petal lotus is because two eyes. The two eyes is a big drama. Why we have two eyes? Why not the cyclops had one eye? And there were many others. If we had one eye, could we have known ourselves better? Possibly. What has happened with two eyes is that two eyes are seeing two different pictures of the universe. We have all got our two eyes open now and we are both seeing two pictures, not one. Two eyes located at different places cannot see the same thing. And that is what is taken advantage of when they make a 3D movie and they uh, shoot two pictures. One at the location of one eye, one at the other. Some cameras have been made now. The two cameras are working at the same location as the two eyes. They take two pictures. They put both the pictures on the screen, single screen. Two pictures are there. Then they give you glasses to separate the two. And it all becomes three-dimensional. Creates distance. Creates this is near, this is far. Creates space. These two eyes of ours are creating space. If the two eyes were not there, we won't have space. Because we are used to the two eyes, we can even see a photograph and things that are smaller or far away. It's still flat. Small things far away, big things near. A road is there narrowing down, it's going far away on a flat screen. The two eyes are seeing two different pictures. To see on a screen outside, we can use those glasses, Polaroid or colored, whatever. How are these two eyes combining the two images? We are not seeing two images. Our two physical eyes are seeing two different images. We are seeing one. Where is this combination taking place without any glasses? It's taking place inside. 
we join them together inside. Where? Exactly at the same point where we are operating from. We are seeing from there, not from the eyes. If we began to see this world from the eyes, we'll see two pictures all the time. We see one picture, the combination, the ability for eyes to combine the image creates one image seen at the, at the center, often called third eye. Third eye center is the location of our conscious being, our self, in the wakeful state in a human body. Wonderful news. If you know that, you got the best guide you could ever get. You want to find yourself, go to third eye center. How can we go to third eye center? We can't travel there. What's the means of going somewhere where we are not going to travel? Supposing I say, let's go to the top of the roof of this building. But a body has, should be left here. Body should be in the chair. Let's go to the roof. We have ability. It's called imagination. You can imagine we are there. What happens when we imagine? If we imagine we are on top of the roof, are we there or here? It depends on how strong our imagination is and how much attention we put into that imagination. When we sit here, our attention is so much in the physical body because day and night we use it as our only self. Very difficult to put too much attention into an imaginary thing. But supposing we did a little exercise. We say, I imagine I'm sitting on top of the building, but I'm still seeing you, so I close my eyes. Okay, now I can't see you. I can imagine better. Okay, I close my ears also. Can't hear you. I can still imagine I'm sitting up there. And I'm sitting, sitting, and I imagine, I'm imagining I'm doing something there. I'm walking on the roof. I'm dancing on the roof. I'm singing on the roof. I'm doing all that there. What will happen? I'm losing less and less aware. I'm getting less and less awareness of this body, more and more awareness of the imaginary self. Simple. Every one of us has that ability to imagine. Now, let's change the game. Don't imagine you are on top of the roof. Imagine you are at the third eye center, in the center of the head. Imagine this head has an opening place inside as you are just sitting in the center. And you try to figure out, am I in the center? Where are my eyes? Oh, they are in front. You can touch them. Yeah, I'm behind. Where are my ears? Exactly in the side. No, maybe they are a little behind. Okay, I'll move forward in my imagination. If you can perform this simple exercise, which everybody can do, the easiest thing that can be done, if you can just put your attention and concentrate, perform all activities there, think of what is happening there, dance there, sing there, remember things there, look around there, look the dark space. It can never be totally dark. Your imagination can create lights, colors, anything. Make it a beautiful place. Make it a garden. If you are able to do that, what will happen? Your attention will go to third eye center. And as you put more attention there, you become less and less aware of the body. I will tell you something very interesting. When you put your attention there and concentrate it, this is not a religion or is any particular dogma. This is a personal experience of everyone. If you can put your attention there imaginatively and say you are there and work there, you will not lose the awareness of the body at once, nor completely. First thing will happen will be you will not know where your hands are. Do you know the whole body? Where are my hands? I don't know where my hands have gone. And you look out. Oh, you just pulled part of your attention. Your attention is scattered so completely into the body that it's only pulled out a little bit from the extremities. You won't know where the feet are. Don't know then. If, depending how long you are there and how much attention you put there, we have this beautiful gift given to us. Imagination, attention, 
the power to concentrate attention, only three things required to go and find yourself. And we all have it. There's no special school to go to for this. We have, all have the power to imagine, the power to put attention where we imagine, the power to concentrate our attention. Start from the third eye center. You will find you don't know where the hands are. You don't know where the legs and arms have gone. You won't know you're floating because you lost the awareness of your bottom. You, you're aware that you have got a head, you are in the head, you still have ears, you don't know where the torso is going. You ultimately don't know where the body is gone. That becomes alive, this becomes unknown. It's not that you are left the body, it's not an outer body experience, it's in the body experience. But you have discovered a form of yours which you always thought was just imagination. And suddenly you find that that form has some strange characteristics which this body did not have. One of the first things you notice is that form of yours does not have any matter in it. It's not physical. It's light. If you try to fly with that form, you can fly anywhere. You can even imagine that your head is like a little hall or a, or a room, depending upon how much fast you can make it. Big garden, fly in it. No problem. Imaginatively, we could fly to the top of this building. We can fly anywhere in the universe with that body, not with this physical body. It's just an imaginative exercise. Looks like that. What is our definition of imagination? Definition of imagination, it is not like the physical reality. That's our only definition. We have no other definition. This is our only reality. Anything else is imagination. That's how we define the imagination. When that imaginary body is real and you are unaware of this body, that's the only reality. And you experience it as a greater reality than this physical body ever felt. But it has to be done up to a point where you can become unaware of this body and become more aware of your inner body. What are the other features? Apart from the fact it has no gravity because there's no matter in it. Other features are its sense perceptions are so sharp. Here we need glasses to read. Our vision is not 20-20. No matter how bad your vision is, inner body can read any print. Have you ever seen that even in an imaginary newspaper you want to read, it's absolutely clear? Which one is reading? Which eyes are reading that? Therefore, the all sense perceptions, not only vision, hearing, vision, test, taste, touch, all become absolutely pure and so sharp. You never experience them in this body. Big difference. But the biggest difference is that the memory, the mind that thinks in this body is the same mind that thinks in that body. And the memory that we try to get when we are in this body is so limited. We can't remember. I can't remember what breakfast I had last week. But I not even what yesterday. My memory is so poor, getting old, age 91. That's a, automatically my assumption is, oh, I am so old, I can't remember anything. Sometimes a good thing. But inside you remember everything. Much better. How can memory change? How can you start remembering things? Here I can't remember except a few incidents of childhood, important ones. And certainly I can't remember a thing about before I was born. There you can remember things before you were born in the physical body. As if you were alive. Why is that? How can you with the inner body remember things that happened even before you were born in the physical body? Because in that body you were alive. It pre-existed the birth of this body. That's a big discovery. A very big discovery when you find that what you thought was imagination turns out to be something in which you can remember things 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago of your own experience, not somebody else's. It's your own self remembering, not anybody else. Same self that's working in this body. Same self working in the inner body. Same self using the mind. Same self using the same soul. Same soul, same mind, same sense perceptions. 
just not this physical body. So in a way, when you have that discovery, it changes your life here completely. You suddenly discover this is a very temporary place we have come to. We have another place where we were living. We just decided to have a little dip into physicality. And when we die, we'll again be without physical form. We'll still be able to look, able to touch, taste, smell. And that's our real self. This is not the real self. This is so short-lived. That has lived for a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years. That's the real self. It's a good big step toward discovering the self. Because at this time, our biggest problem is that we can't get out of the notion that this is the only self. This is the only reality and this is the only self. We can't get over it. And that is why this single experience changes that. I recommend that if nothing else, you want to get a real feeling of what this whole world is like, why we are here, is to go at least one step. But of course, there are many masters have come who have been able to teach the same thing. Method is simple. Concentrate your attention at the third eye center and you'll get that feeling. If you want to get energetic feelings, new kinds of energies, ability to read people's minds, ability to feel you have gone out of the body, physical body and see it, you can do concentration of attention at energy centers also. That's a different experience. If you want to know yourself, that you are more than what is here, then you have to go steadily to third eye center and not go down below that at all. Tendency to go down will be very strong. When we meditate, why do we have a tendency to sleep? Because we're used to it. Every night we sleep. That is why in the initial stages, most people find when they meditate at third eye center, they fall asleep very quickly. In fact, some people who have insomnia, I recommend a treatment called meditation. <laughs> you get good sleep. Because the tendency to sleep is so strong, we have been doing it all this physical life. Therefore, the shift of our attention below that is very strong. That is why many precautions are taken. You know, these are tips for those who are really practicing. It's not a theoretical model I'm expressing to you. I'm telling you the real tips to prevent sleeping during meditation. You have to make this level, eye level, where the third eye exists, into a very strong, firm platform. I've sometimes recommended put some steel girders there, imaginatively. Put concrete, pour concrete. Make it so strong and jump on it inside imaginatively to see it's strong. Because you will only sleep if it goes down below that. Otherwise, you remain there. And then meditation becomes successful. There are a large number of tips I can give you to make this effective. Because I know problems that come. I've gone through them myself. That is why when we have these intensive meditation retreats, that's where I feel that we can make the maximum use because every day we meditate moving one step closer to the self. What are other steps closer to self? Not easy. Simple. Very simple, but very difficult. The simplicity of the process is you just keep going within yourself. Right now, we have found we are behind the eyes at third eye center. We put imagination and attention there. Simple step, difficult. We, next step, with the inner self, put your attention inside the head of the inner self. We still have the same head. Sometimes a little different, depending upon what our past experiences are before the birth of this body. We have many strange experiences in that body. So when you put your attention behind that, you open up another self of yours. No form. No sense perceptions, no eyes, no ears, nothing. Very strange. It's still the same self. It's not another self you found. 
same self operating now. What is that self? It's your mind. Thinking mind. It's still thinking. When you meditate in the inner self, at the third eye center of the inner self and become unaware of the sense perceptions, that opens up and you discover you are just the mind and the soul. These were just covers you put on yourself for short periods. Physical body, what, 50 years, 100 years, 120 years, what, what's a small inner body, 1,000 years, 3,000 years, 2,000 years, physical time. Now you come to the real thing. The mind and the soul have lived for millions of years of physical time. Same mind, same thoughts, same karma, same destinies, same things carried on in that inner self with no perceptions except total perception of the mind. Mental perception covers all perceptions. For the first time you will discover there's a division of perception into seeing Touching, tasting, hearing is merely a division of perception. That your capability as a mind and soul is to perceive all this directly, completely. The division was just made to have a different experience. You can't say it here because we think they are different. There you discover they were one. We divided them in the so-called astral body or imaginative body or sensory body but they get combined at the mind. And yet, the mind thinks the same way it is thinking now, except it thinks much clearer. Because it can see so much, it can see how the bodies are created, it sees that these were just covers upon us. We discover a reality of our own self, that we are truly nothing but a thinking mind, powered by life, which is called soul. We do not... for for some time realize that the mind is also a body, that the mind is also. Just because the mind's main function is thinking, making sense, and creating. It creates things. How? Thinking and creating things from concepts. It creates concepts, and the concepts play out in the sensory body into ideas. And ideas play out into physical world out here. That function of the mind you realize there. Amazing. And yet, you're not even the mind. Most perfect masters who were called perfect masters took us to that place where we discovered we were merely a mind and soul living, living in harmony. Soul giving power of life to the mind, mind thinking, creating, whatever it created there became actual creation in the physical world. It created all the worlds that exist. Nothing exists in the physical universe or in the astral universe that are not created by the mind at the causal plane. That is why we call it causal plane. And we call that form, Karan Shariz, the Shariz, the body that causes everything to happen. So that is a form of our own self, it's possible to go there. Now, I keep on saying it's simple. It is simple because all you are doing is go within, more within, more within. We are doing nothing else. The recipe is so simple. Go within, go more within. That's all the recipe. But why is it difficult? Because we have started enjoying this devolution that we took by putting on more bodies into new experiences has made us enjoy some of these things, desire some more, attached to most of them. Attachment and desire. Mostly in the astral plane, sensory plane, and to some extent in the physical plane are holding us here. When we try a simple thing to put our attention inside, the mind runs out to these attachments and desires. That's the difficulty. The difficulty is not in the process. The difficulty is in the application because we have got so attached to things. And then we say, every time I try to meditate, I remember all the things. Outside things come up. Mind is terrible. I can't meditate. Mind is very happy. I won. 
I kept you out what I like. The mind likes all these attachments and desires and whatever little joy it can get out of these experiences. That's exactly why it came here. That's why it created these universes to have a little fun, have some good adventure, enjoy. He didn't know it'll be such a big roller coaster and it'll be up and down and pain and pleasure. But still, we're still attached in spite of the pain and pleasure. We have all these attachments here and we can't get rid of them. That is what makes it difficult, nothing else. So then we try to practice detachment. Most horrible experience to try to practice <laughs> detachment. The more we try to detach, the more attached we get. I sometimes tell my story. I came to the United States and I found a nice pizza place called Shakey's Pizza. And I said, oh, I'm going the wrong way. I'm getting attached to Shakey's Pizza now. So I closed my eyes. I said, I'm going to get rid of this. No more Shakey's Pizza. No more Shakey's Pizza. The more Shakey's Pizza came in front of me. You can't detach yourself by trying to detach. Never. Nobody has ever succeeded. And yet that's the only way we have tried. Yet we say our attachment is causing difficulty and we cannot detach ourselves. Then what is the solution? Solution is, if you get attached to something better than the attachment you have here, detachment comes automatically. When I found a better pizza, <laughs> Pizza Hut, <laughs> I have forgotten the Shaki's existed. It is only by a new attachment that detachment takes place. And one of the greatest powers of such a strong attachment that makes you detached to everything in one lifetime is the attachment to the very powerful love we sometimes experience from a perfect living master. Perfect living masters don't come to give teachings to us. They are not teachers. They are other masters, all teachers. They teach you how to meditate. They teach you how to understand things. They teach you for your mind. Perfect living masters come to take us to our true home back. That is why their method is simple. They pull us with their love. We can't see it because our mind is questioning. Mind is creating doubts and fears. Doubts and fears is a function of the mind, built-in function of the mind, a good function. So we don't get carried away by anybody saying anything. It's a good screening device. But the love of a master pulls us. It's something very subtle. Why is a master's love so subtle? Not like regular love we have in the world. What is so subtle about it? Subtlety is... It is appealing to our soul and not necessarily to our mind, not even necessarily to our body. It's appealing to our soul where the seeking started. It touches the seeking in us and that's what touches. That's what makes a difference. We feel it so deep. Mind is thinking against it. Mind is creating doubts. At the same time the feeling comes. I was telling my friend the other day of a professor, a very intellectual professor who came to great master and he said, master, I want to tell you something. What you are saying to people is all wrong. There are no inner regions. There's nothing beside this world. This is our only reality. This is our only life. We are born. We live a destiny by chance created and we die. And oh, why are you making a fool of these people? Telling them, oh, you meditate, you go to higher region. Nobody is gone. Professor told great master. The great master said, Professor, you have a right to your opinion. It's based upon your experience and you have a right to it. My experience is a little different. So we have a right to our, and we can disagree peacefully. I have a different experience. You have a different one. Thank you very much for your honesty that you came and told me your honest experience. Professor went away. Next week he was back. And he said, Master, I've come to tell you one thing. You, what you're teaching is not correct at all. You're making a fool of people. Please don't do that. Great Master said, you did express your opinion last week. And I remember. And I think what you think is right. My feeling about these things is different because my experience is different. 
We have a right to have different experiences and different opinions. But thank you, Professor, for your honesty. Next week, Professor was back. <laughs> Third time, Master have come to tell you that what you teach is not really correct. He said, Professor, you told me this the last two weeks also. Why do you think it necessary to come and tell me again? He said, I don't know. I want to come and see you. <laughs> Mind is saying something totally different from what the soul is saying. And he became one of the finest disciples of Great Master. And I remember how he used to share all this information with me about his days of doubt, days of mental intellectual exercises, and the day of being pulled by the love of a master and experiencing that love, which can be so overwhelming. The more time we spend with these perfectly masters and see the love flowing from them, the more affected we are. And not only more affected, more detached we are from what we are attached to earlier. It's the greatest attachment that detaches you from everything. So that is why detachment cannot be practiced. But a new, greater attachment can detach you from that which is lesser than the new attachment. So that is why these masters come to pull us with their love. I am so happy that you could all join me. I celebrate this Bandara of the 2nd of April every year since he passed away. And I want to share the grace that flows on this day. I want to share with all seekers. I want they should get that benefit. Understand what the beauty of a perfect living master's love is. It is totally unconditional. No condition whatsoever. No judgment whatsoever. A perfect living master never comes to judge if you are a good person or a bad person. He is already aware we are bad persons. He already knows our karmas. He knows what we are going through. He knows how we are feeling guilty. He knows everything. He knows our life. Why would he then come to judge when he knows us? That we are in a strange state. We do things that our mind says was wrong. And we have guilt carrying in our head. We feel very guilty. No, no, no. I should not have done that. And then we do it again. How many of you, please raise your hands if you have decided ever not to do something and then done it again. It's a universal thing. That's our mind. So therefore, masters know that. Masters come to see that if we say what we do bad or is guilty is sin, we are all sinners. So how can masters come and judge who is a lesser sinner or bigger sinner? They don't come to look at our sins. They don't come to look at our virtues. They don't look, look at our destinies. They don't come to see what karma we have. They do not come to see where we are stationed in life. They come only in response to the seeking of the soul to find itself and go home. Period. That's what a perfect living master comes for. And we can't find them. Because they come like ordinary people like us. No difference. They appear like ordinary people. There's no way to judge. An ordinary person is a master or a perfect living master. When we associate with them, something pulls us. We begin to feel there is something there. Our mind is overcome eventually by the soul's pull through love. That's the biggest thing. If you ask me to define the spiritual path in the shortest phrase, I would say it's a path of love and devotion. Period. Not meditation. Love and devotion. Meditation merely means of validating some of these things that we hear. Just a means of validating that there are other forms of us living. Means of validating that the physical body is not ourself and that we have lived earlier and we live later. And we even understand how people who have died are living in different state. How we can even access them. So many other experiments we can do. It's only meditation is only for that. Not for going to our true home or to discover our true self. Because meditation is done by the self, by the mind of the self. And therefore, it's not the self. Discovery of the self takes place when you go within. Now, I leave a very important idea in your head to think about. 
what happens when you eventually reach the top of your awareness with the pull of love of a perfectly living master like great master baba sawan singh here what happens at the end you discover the self yourself was the master he just appeared in that other form he appeared in the form of the many there's only one yourself was the master yourself for the truth yourself for your true home and everything was in yourself including the master therefore it's only the manyness of creation in which we look for outside help look for thing a master appears is a self appearing in a different form the true self appearing in a different form at the level at which we have reduced ourselves to this form and that is why the ultimate reality is amazing what we thought was master outside was also a projection of ourselves what we thought master was a radiant form inside was also a projection of ourselves the master who accompanied us in the causal plane was also ourselves the soul of the master the soul of ours who danced with joy in par brahm beyond the mind was also ourselves ultimately there was nothing but the self that is how the self contains everything and that is why search for the self will give you all the answers to all your questions we we'll take a break now and i hope to see you little later at about 3 o'clock and i'll explain little more about how a perfectly master operates and how we how we find find him or how he finds us thank you very much for your patient listening